Well, good morning, Liberty Orlando. Today, you've got the both of us. It's double trouble. <laughs> but uh, Dan and I have been recording our podcast, and uh, we have the opportunity to welcome you to our services this morning. If you are visiting with us today, we are so happy to have you, and I hope that you enjoy your time at Liberty Orlando and recognize that you know, Liberty is just a, a part of a larger fellowship here in Oklahoma. We are, are truly privileged to serve alongside all of you great people down there yeah. in the beautiful Sunshine State. Yeah. Well, Pastor Dan did a great message this last week. So, Dan, why don't you tell the folks what we've got in store? Yeah, well, first of all, let me say to you that for those of you who are guests and you may not know this, we don't always sit behind mics like this, <laughs> and I don't always wear a T-shirt or whatever. Uh, we just happen to do a lot of our welcomes while we're filming our podcast, yeah. just so you'll know for those who don't know. Uh, yeah, so so I'm Dan. I, I serve along with Paul, and we're just we're just honored to be joined up with you, like he said. You know, over the, the last few weeks, we've all heard the terrible news of what happened down in Uvalde, Texas, and, you know, around the country, and these shootings, and, of course, the, the libs on the left are trying to make a big deal about it, and we wanted to address the subject. Paul and I, in the past, have given the biblical perspective on the right to defend each other and uh, arms, defend right. ourselves mm -hmm. and to, to own firearms. And then I've, I've dealt with, uh, is, is war ever a proper option? And, and, and the Bible deals with all these things, but I wanted to touch on what had happened. And I happened to be up this past Sunday. So what I did is I preached a message entitled Morals and Mayhem. And what I wanted to do is point out that the problem that we're seeing with school shootings and in other places is really not a gun problem. Now, I think that the, the local police there in Uvalde made some huge mistakes. It's obvious the school made some mistakes. Teachers made mistakes. But the real problem is a moral problem. And so I'm dealing with that horrible tragedy from that perspective. And it's really, Paul, kind of a, a real warning to America that mm -hmm. if we don't get our hearts right in the church right. and realize the connection, we're going to lose not only this republic, we're going to lose our culture. Well, the Bible says that righteousness exalts, exalts a, nation, a nation, but sin, sin is a is reproach to all of us. Yep. Yeah. And that's the passage that I'll be using this morning. We'll look at other verses, but if you want to turn your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 14, we're going to be looking at verse 34, and then we'll kind of move around. So God bless you. It's an honor to work with you, and I hope this message is a blessing. Paul, anything else? We'll see you next week. Yeah. God bless you. All of us are beginning to suffer from fatigue. Are, aren't you? Aren't you just suffering from tragedy, stupid fatigue in our culture today? I mean, if it's not tragic, it's just downright moronic uh, that, you, that that's around us and it just eating us up. And I said last week that I wanted to deal with the shooting in Uvalde, Texas. So I want to do that today, but I want to come at it from a different perspective than what you might expect. Uh, Paul and I have in the past dealt with the subject of the Second Amendment. What would the Bible's perspective be on that? Do you have not only an unalienable right, but a biblical right to own a firearm to protect yourself? The answer to that is yes, but we've dealt with that subject. What about when things get so bad that people have to band together and stand up against tyranny? Is, is that biblically uh, admissible? The answer to that is yes. So if you want to go and check out the sermons or the lessons that we've taught on those things, they are on our website. And you know, you need to take advantage of that archive. Many of you will ask questions about certain things. Typically, uh, Paul and I have dealt with many of those subjects. And they're out there either in sermon or lesson form. So go to our website and check it out. So I'm going to approach this subject from a little different perspective. Because what I really want to do is I want to drill into why. Why are these tragedies happening? It almost seems on a weekly basis. And if it's not a shooting at a school, it's something else that is just, just either culture shattering or uh, globally impactful. And it's typically not a good thing. So I want to begin with some uh, uh, a particular commercial. There have been many that has been airing all week long on iHeartRadio. I don't know if you use iHeart, but it's actually a way to listen to conservative radio, for that matter, any kind of radio stations, but for me, conservative talk show 
uh, programs, rather than listening on a radio, uh, I can look it up on the web and listen on my computer or my mobile device like a cell phone. And so iHeart is the mechanism that you use to do that. And some of you probably use it. If you don't, you ought to take advantage of it. You can carry it with you and you don't have to have a radio. You can be listening online to the very same thing that's being broadcast on the radio. But there is a commercial that has been running all week long because they've named June Pride Month. Have you noticed that the, the obscene and the perverted always try to find that which they perceive to be pure and representing the principles of God, and they always co-opt that? So like June has traditionally always been marriage month, it isn't coincidental that that's the month that the gay pride movement has taken. And by the way, being pride about being, being proud about being demented is not a positive thing. Just understand that. I mean, why don't we have adulterer and adulteresses pride month? And how about a uh, liar pride month and a thief pride month? I mean, you know, see, see the re ridiculousness of it. And then notice that the, the, the gay pride movement has also co-opted or stolen the rainbow which was, of course, God's sign of covenant and promise of life, and they grabbed the rainbow and made it their symbol for perversion. So that's what the devil always does. The devil takes the best things of God, if he can, and tries to twist them into something demented and, and wicked. And that's just what he does, and he will try to do that with you. He'll try to do that with me. And that's why we need to always be on guard that we don't even... Um, ignorantly become a pawn of the devil as he uses what I believe he loves to do, God's people to do bad stuff. So it's important. Well, this commercial has been running all week long and they've been advertising three of the programs that I'm going to put on the screen for you. This is one that's a little bit older, but it's a television series that first aired back in December of 2000. So we're looking at 22 years ago. Can you believe that? We're that far into this? But it's called Queer as Folk. And by the way, these are all titles that, that I'm reading. I'm reading from the website, so I'm not, these are, none, of, none of these are my terms. Terms they use for themselves. It's a television series, as I said, that started in 2000, ran to August the 7th, 2005. And the series follows the lives of five gay men. By the way, notice how they co-opted the word gay. Yeah. Yeah. You remember the old song, When Johnny Comes Marching Home? You know, we'll all feel gay when Johnny comes out. So they grab words and make them almost unusable for us today. So it follows the lives of five gay men living in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So, so they've been promoting this all week long, queer as folk. And then they've promoted, been promoting this program. It's called The Book of Queer. And according to their own uh, promotion, The Book of Queer, is a new Discovery Plus five-part series that follows multiple historic and groundbreaking queer individuals throughout history. It has been described as drunk history meets an LGBTQ plus studies course. So you just double down on dumb. Uh, the series delves into the origins, now get this, of queer symbols lexicon and civil rights figures with a heavy dose of absurdist humor and fantastic wardrobes. It proves that there have always been people who subverted, now that's probably a proper term, subverted the norms surrounding gender and sexuality spanning from the Egyptian pharaohs to Abraham Lincoln. But beneath it all is a solid backbone of scholarly research. So you just know that this is filled with facts. So it's called the Book of Queer. And that's been promoted all week long on iHeart Radio. And then the third program that they've been promoting is this one called Generation Drag. And I think this one's actually produced, or it was either this one or the one before, by a producer out of Texas. So don't think that just because you live in Oklahoma, Texas, or Arkansas, or some of these more conservative areas that you're safe, because not necessarily. But what is generation drag? Well, notice this beautiful cast of characters here. I mean, gosh, who couldn't say, wow. Um, Generation Drag is a television series produced by Tyra Banks for Discovery Plus. So notice the common thread here is Discovery Plus. Don't watch Discovery Plus. That premiered on June the 1st, 2022. So this is brand new. 
The show features, get this, children ages 12 to 17 preparing for a drag ball along with their families. Reception to the show has been mixed with some accusing it of grooming, you think? Among its producers, guess the, get this, two of the producers, one is called Monkey Kingdom. How appropriate is that? A subsidiary of NBC and then the other production company is Catfight Productions. Now, all of this is being promoted almost like it's all normal. This is, this is LGBTQ plus Pride Month. I mean, come on. Get with it, guys. This is the world that we live in. Now, you say, well, what does this have to do with the shooting in Uvalde, Texas? Well, I'm not suggesting that these programs or even these people would promote something like that. In fact, to their credit, they would probably decry what happened in Texas. So I'm not saying that they are the sole reason, but these are signs of something wrong in a culture. And that's the reason why I'm bringing this up. Now, I know you know much of this, but I think sometimes we have to be reminded of the newest, more bodacious forms of blasphemy. And it's what God calls it. God calls all of this an abomination. Now, of course, he would also call liars and drunks and adulterers and adulteresses uh, 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 abominable too. But this is kind of the bottom of the barrel, you know. In fact, Adrian Rogers used to say, not only has America eaten to the bottom of the trash can, we've eaten a hole in the bottom of the trash can. I mean, we've really gone below uh, the bottom. In fact, speaking of Adrian, I want you to listen to what he said. He said, we're all laughing and, and all these comedians are talking about all this stuff. We're laughing our way to hell, he says. In fact, he said, if you take part of the truth and you make that part of the truth all of the truth, then that part of the truth becomes an untruth. And that is exactly what is happening in our culture. We are taking pieces of information, we're removing them from the context, and you know, if you tell a partial truth in order to deceive, that actually is a whole lie. You know that? And that is exactly what he's saying here. So you see, we're taking these little pieces of things and we're creating a culture of lies and deception. Well, the hits keep coming. This is a school in Kyle, Wisconsin. Wisconsin of all places. The Kyle, Wisconsin school district, citing federal Title IX, just brought sexual harassment charges against, and this should say eight, three eighth grade boys because they did not call another student by their preferred pronouns of they and them. Now, of course, it had been in Little Rock, it'd be y'all and usins, but anyway, it's, it's they and them. Um, but, but notice here, they're bringing sexual harassment charges against three eighth grade boys for not using proper pronouns. If that had been the scene when Paul and I were in school, we'd be in solitary confinement for life. My gosh, we'd be in deep trouble. Here, these, these kids are now, of course, the parents are going to have to defend these kids. And thankfully, a conservative defense group has stepped in to help them. But imagine a school district being so stupid as to press sexual harassment. That'd be the same as if you were threatening rape or something else to eighth grade boys because they didn't use proper pronouns. Now, do you see the connection now? So you see the connection with Queer as Folk and the Book of Queer and Drag Queen and all. See, see, it's all starting to come together here. This all flows. So testifying at a House Judiciary Committee just a few weeks ago, this hearing was examining abortion access and services in the U.S. Amy, and I, I'm not sure how you pronounce her last name, Arambide, uh, uh, apologies if that's incorrect. She's the executive director of Avow. Now, that's a Texas-based organization. See what I said a while ago? Just because we're in Oklahoma or Texas doesn't mean that we're immune from this. This is a Texas-based organization devoted to, and I quote, securing unrestricted abortion care. What is their care about abortion? You're murdering a baby. I don't figure that's any kind of care whatsoever. And reproductive rights. So they always use terms. Remember, the use a part of a truth. And you misuse it, it becomes a total untruth. See, it's exactly what's going on here. So she is responding to questions by a North Carolina congressman by the name of Dan Bishop. So listen to this little short clip. And for me, it's just, it's simply unbelievable. But I think it's, it, it's a perfect sign 
of the idiocy of our age. What do you say a woman is? I believe that everyone can identify for themselves. Okay. Um, do, do you believe then that men can become pregnant and have abortions? Yes. I mean, when I was going to school, that was an easy question. N no. Well, it was just as easy for her. She just gave the wrong answer. Now, you know what you get when you give the wrong answer to a question? An F. You flunk the test. Can you believe that we live in a time when a congressman in an official hearing in Washington, D.C., with the cameras rolling and the lights up, asks what ought to be, it sounds like a fairly intelligent young woman, can a man get pregnant and have an abortion? And she says, yes. Now, we all know what she's trying to say. She's trying to say that, um, you know, uh, a, a man who wants to be a woman or a woman who wants to be a man, you know, there's still some biological functions that, that you know, can, can work even though you've gone through some kind of sexual trans. It's, it's all a bunch of nonsense. The answer to the question is no. A man cannot get pregnant and a man cannot have an abortion. But this is a symbol of where we live. Now, just days ago, to add insult to injury, a Supreme Court justice, regardless of what we think about some of the things the Supreme Court has done, they are official. Brett Kavanaugh was actually almost assassinated. Now, as far as I know, from every source that I'm reading, this is the first time in history this has ever happened. In fact, this 26-year-old man, this is a picture of him, obviously, when he was a little bit younger, from Simi Valley, California, actually traveled from California to Washington, D.C., with a number of ways in which he could murder Brett Kavanaugh, including having zip ties and all the stuff that would go along with it, traveled to D.C. to murder him. Now, here's the amazing thing. I was visiting with a friend of mine who is a pastor. This pastor has been very engaged in politics for years. In fact, he actually helped to run a congressman's office. That's how engaged he's been. But he's a pastor. He's a wonderful guy. He's a wonderful friend. And, you know, I love the guy. But I was visiting with him on Friday, and this subject came up. He had never heard of it. He did not know that, she, that Justice Brett Kavanaugh was nearly assassinated. In fact, if the police had not intervened, he probably would have been. This guy was ready to go, and they, they arrested him just a little distance from, from Justice Kavanaugh's house. Now, why is that? Well, on Thursday, the day after this news hit, the New York Times covered it 20 pages deep in the newspaper. The Washington Post buried it so deeply that it was on the same level with one of the coaches, Jack Del Rio, of what used to be the Washington Redskins. He made some comments about January the 6th that weren't popular with the leftist crowd, so he's in all kinds of hot water, and I think he's been fined 100 Gs. I'd tell him to go pound sand if I was Jack Del Rio. But anyway, uh, this story of an assassination attempt of a Supreme Court justice was on level with the comments of a, a football coach on another subject. CNN buried the story in their 26th tier of news information. I'm here to tell you that the majority of people in America don't even know that there was an assassination attempt on Brett Kavanaugh. And the proof of it is my good friend who's actually in the ministry and is very politically connected. See, we live in a world where not only are these terrible things being promoted, not only are these terrible things like Uvalde happening, but we're also living in a world where the average person who doesn't take enough time to try to work to find the truth doesn't know the truth. Christians are walking... I'm talking about Christians. Forget about the pagans that don't even know God. There are, I believe, probably a majority of Christians who are walking around that do not know this stuff. Now, let me prove it to you. I received a phone call yesterday morning from an old friend. I love the guy. He's a great guy. 
And he said, man, I'm listening to Bot Radio, and there's, there's this uh, person on there, and they're talking about this global movement and these, these multi-billionaires that are trying to destroy the American economy and this global thing, and, and we need to be talking about that. Preachers need to be talking about it. Well, I listened to the voicemail. I didn't actually talk to him, so I texted him back, and I said, hey, listen, that's called the Great Reset, and these people led by folks like Soros and Gates and others meet in Davos and other places and they've been working on this for months and they're trying to not only destroy these United States of America they're actually trying to destroy all government globally to initiate this great reset and Paul Blair and I have been teaching and preaching on this for months now here was what my friend's response was well I wish my pastor would talk about it that's probably true. I didn't send this response back because I wanted to say, then why don't you get the heck out of that church? Why would you continue to attend a church where the pastor isn't talking about something as insidious as the Great Reset? Here's the thing, guys. He had just discovered it yesterday morning. My point is, most people, even Christians, are totally unsuspecting. They don't have any idea what's going on. They know inflation's high. They know that the gas prices have basically doubled. They know that there's things going on, but they do not know. It takes work these days. It takes dedication to be able to know the truth, sadly. Now, all of this is leading me then into Uvalde. There's a reason why that happened. You say, well, it's because there's not enough gun control. It had nothing to do with guns. Isn't it amazing that when killers use vehicles, no one stands up and says, we need to get rid of automobiles? Yeah. Or when killers, by the way, did you know the, the, the greatest number of homicides are committed with knives, not guns? Most people don't even know that. So when there are killings with knives, I don't remember any congressmen or women standing up saying, we've got to control knives, arrest all of those chefs. We need to make sure that there's no runaway knives. Uh, or what about machetes? There's foreign countries where there's actually school killings or what we call mass killings with machetes. I don't hear anybody saying we ought to outlaw machetes. Or what about baseball bats? See, here's the deal. You keep working your way down. Eventually, you'll have to outlaw rocks because Cain used a rock to kill his brother. See, if someone's evil and wants to do someone in, they'll find a way. By the way, did you know that the largest school killing in United States history did not involve a knife? It did involve a gun, and it didn't involve an automobile. You know what it was? A bomb. It was a bomb. More people were killed in that school killing than in any we've ever had, and a gun wasn't even involved. It was a bomb. How is this happening? What is going on here? Well, I believe it's all signs. These are all signs telling us something is terribly wrong here. Now, God help the people of Uvalde. My gosh, our hearts just go out to them. But you see, this is another one of those trimmers. I often put pictures on the screen. I probably should have. But you've seen them before. You remember months before Mount St. Helens erupted in 1980? Uh, for months, they'd been warning all the people that lived near there, something bad's about to happen. Something bad's about to happen. You need to uh, prepare and get out of there. And there was an old guy named Harry Truman who owned and operated the Spirit Lake Lodge. You remember that guy, kind of a crotchety old guy? Uh, he wouldn't leave. He said, well, you know... I've been here all my life. There's lots of trees between me and the mountain. It's over a mile away. Uh, everything's going to be fine. Well, today, Harry Truman and his lodge are 150 feet deep in parts of Mount St. Helens. Anybody who was in that kill zone met a terrible death. Over 50 people were killed because they just simply would not get out of there. But you see, they had plenty of warning of the cataclysm that's coming. I believe that Uvalde and all these things that we're seeing... These are all trimmers. These are cultural trimmers warning us of what's going on. So I want to talk this morning in the remaining amount of time a message entitled Morals and Mayhem. There's a direct connection. When in Uvalde this 18-year-old man made his way into that school and murdered those 21 people, it's a terrible day. I, can, I can't even imagine. 
I can't imagine being one of the parents who didn't know, wondering, is my children one of those ones that he's shooting at? I can hear him. It was failures at every level, failures at the school. We've all heard the stories. Failures of local law enforcement, as much as I am pro-law enforcement, boy, in this particular instance, it appears to me, though I'm not an authority, that they really blew it at a lot of levels. In fact, I understand from kind of insider information that the Border Patrol or troopers that actually broke through and took this guy out did so against the wishes of the local law enforcement. They just blew through the barricades and did it anyway. Thank God they did. They stood out there for over an hour while this jerk's still in there shooting his gun. What if they had responded immediately? Have you heard the pathetic 9-11 calls from one of those little children in the classroom? If you've got the guts for it, you ought to listen. It'll break your heart. This little kid is calling 911, just constantly saying, help us, please send the police now. The police were there. They were outside doing whatever it is they were doing. Let me tell you what I'd do in a situation like that. I'll, I'll storm that place and try to save as many as I can. If it takes me out, fine. Amen. What a terrible tragedy. But friends, I'm telling you, I'm surprised it isn't happening more. I don't want it to happen at all. But I'm surprised that it doesn't happen more frequently. You say, what in the world are you talking about? Well, I'm not talking about school shootings or whatever in particular. I'm talking about the mayhem that we're watching practically every day. I'm almost afraid to turn on the news. What was it? Two or three days later, at least a week, and we had the same basic thing happen in Tulsa. It's just that the officials there responded quicker and did the right thing. But there was a time... When even in school, you'd pray. This may be a little before mine and Paul's time, but not much. I remember. Was that the turning point? I, I, I don't know. Probably not. You know, I don't think it was so much that we took prayer and Bible reading and the Ten Commandments out of the schools that's caused the problem. I think it was the heart that took them out that's causing the problem. I mean, most of the prayers that we prayed were fairly innocent. I mean, we'd pray before lunch. I don't figure too many people are going to, know, going to come to know Christ because we asked God to bless the mess down there in the cafeteria. You remember when we still prayed at ball games? As a pastor, I was often asked to go to the press box and pray. Now, how do you pray? God help us to slaughter those guys on the other side. Right? That's how Paul prays. I mean, I sure as heck wasn't going to pray for them to slaughter us. And then not only that, but you're playing a game that puts you in great proximity and probability of injury. And we play, oh God, don't let anybody get hurt. Come on. That's like playing Dodge the Semi and I-35 saying, God, don't let me get hit. Come on, get out of the road. Now, I love football and I'm not saying we shouldn't be in sport. I just, I'm just saying, how do you pray? So I'm not so sure that all the prayer in school was accomplishing as much as we sometimes imply that it was. But here's the thing. A culture where prayer and Bible reading and the Ten Commandments are not welcome, that culture's in trouble. That culture's on its way out. It's on its way down. You know this verse, Proverbs 14, 34. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Now, most of us have read that verse, and we think that it's referring to the judgment day. It's way off in the future. See, we, we misunderstand a lot of what God's Word says. Friends, there's not just one judgment day. Look through history. There have been multiple judgment days. As we're going to see in just a moment, Israel faced multiple judgment days. I'm here to tell you, I think America is facing judgment day now. I think what is happening in our culture is we're finally starting to reap the whirlwind of the seeds that we have sown. And as Galatians and other places in the Old Testament remind us, don't deceive yourself. God is not mocked. What a man sows, he reaps. You cannot kick God out of every public sector. You can't kick God out of the Democrat Party and expect God to stick around and everything to work out okay. And so here we are, and I think that reproach to any people is present, not sometime in the future. People say to me, Dan, you think America is going to be judged by God? I look at them and say, America is being judged by God. 
You see, there's all kinds of ways that God judges. Sometimes God doesn't judge directly. He just simply pulls back his hand. I've preached on that just a few weeks ago. You remember the Old Testament passage that says, uh, Ephraim has turned to his idols, leave him alone. Yeah. Romans chapter 1, three times God gave them over to their wickedness and debauchery. God just said, okay, have at it. And that was its own form of judgment. When you read about the culture that that creates, you don't think that that's judgment? Friends, these United States of America are facing God's judgment right now. And it is my opinion that Uvalde, no negative inference on the people that live there. I'm not suggesting they deserve it any more than any or all of us deserve it. But that was just another sign of God's judgment. And I fear that we ain't seen the half of it yet. This is a man who is a pastor down in Georgia. He is also head of a ministry, kind of a missions ministry, and he's also a, a pretty good writer. And he wrote this essay entitled, The Gospel, Human Flourishing and the Foundation of Social Order. I want to read to you just a few little parts. Jason Glass says, and I quote, the shift in moral climate does affect freedom in all forms. Evangelicals must not compartmentalize, Paul, the church, state, and economy into independent spheres, but understand that religious freedom, specifically Christianity, is foundational and concomitant to social, political, and economic freedom. The moral, religious, and philosophical climate of a populace shapes political, civic, and economic conditions of a nation. The redefinition of marriage, he says, for example, and family is the poster child of human wickedness and social decline. The breakdown of marriage and family threatens freedom because family is the primary institution of moral and character development and society must protect the family as the smallest unit of political order. Let me tell you, friends, when a city like Edmond, Oklahoma, and I'm not trying to launch an attack here, but will elect a man as mayor, who will do the things that this mayor has done. Number one, we ought to fall on our faces and ask God to forgive us, and then somebody ought to stand up and say, I'll run. Some God-fearing man or woman needs to stand up, preferably men, some of us, and run. Run for mayor. But you see, when we create a void, and since God's creation hates a void, something or someone always fills that void. And so it's foundational. Listen to Psalm 106, verses 35 through 40. This is God talking to his people. By the way, his chosen people. The only people in history that can carry that title. America is not God's chosen people. Only Israel. I want you to listen. But they, meaning Israel, God says, mingled with the Gentiles. For today we would say pagans. And learned their works. They served idols, which became a snare to them. They even sacrificed their sons and their daughters to demons and shed innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan. And the land was polluted with blood. You could almost put America everywhere where you see Canaan or Israel. Thus they were defiled by their own works and played the harlot. Now that's talking about spiritual harlotry. By their own deeds. Notice, it wasn't something that came upon them. It's something they brought upon themselves. Now catch this next line. Therefore the wrath of the Lord was kindled against all those pagans. No, his people. So that he abhorred his own inheritance. He's talking about Israel here. Listen to those words. The wrath of the Lord was kindled against his people. He abhorred his own inheritance. Now, let me tell you something that I encounter across America among Christians. We won't say it, but we seem to believe that we're something special. And that somehow, because we're one nation under God, we say that all the time in our pledge, we have in God we trust printed on our currency, that God owes us something, that we're so special that God would never judge us and that somehow America is always going to be prosperous. You know, you're hearing right now of food shortages. Unfortunately, 
it will be those third and second world countries that, that receive the greatest blow, and these people will be starving to death. But, you know, we kind of beat our chest and say, well, whew, at least not here. We may have to pay more, but we won't be starving. See, we think we're better. Well, let me tell you something, friend. If God said about his own chosen people, I abhor them. You think he won't say that about America? America didn't take Israel's place. There's no replacement theology. Now, yeah, we had a pretty good beginning from a fairly godly culture. But guys, that doesn't mean a thing today. We've completely turned our backs on God. America deserves everything we get. And I don't want to see it. And I'm a part of it. But I'm afraid I've lived to see it. You know, we're all shouting, hey, Roe v. Wade may be about to go down, and hopefully it will. But friends, we've already murdered over 60 million. Right. How many million does it take for God to say, that cuts it? Yeah. Now, can you repent? Well, yes, but even in Israel, when you study about their own journey, you will find that over and over and over and over, God would rebuke them and reprimand them and discipline them. Sometimes they would repent, but it never lasted long. And eventually God pulled the ripcord. Eventually God said, too much. Too much. You're done. Now will God still work through the descendants of Abraham? Oh yes. Romans 11 is very clear about that. But those people, done. And even the godly were caught up in it. Look at Daniel and his three buddies, that three asbestos boys. Wouldn't bend, wouldn't bow, they wouldn't burn. They're all over there in Babylon. Now God honored them and used them, but they're still captives. Now, you think that somehow we're so good that we're going to bypass all of that? And if you look at how progressively God dealt with those Israelites, he would do things like withhold the rain. Now, you withhold the, you withhold the rain in any age, and that's a bad deal. But when you're an agrarian society and you can't really do the things that we can do with electric water pumps and all this kind of stuff and irrigation, you're in real trouble if God shuts off the, the, the faucet. But why was he doing that? To try to get their attention. Just like if you're a good parent, you will discipline your child and you'll get their attention. Many times you can start off more mild, but if they continue to rebel, then the discipline has to become more and more severe. Why? Because you hate them? No, because you love them, God says. Until finally God said, that's it. That's it. Those who were here at the beginning of our republic kind of understood this. Here's a German, I don't know what you'd call him, philosopher, historian, J.W. Von Goey, and, and he, uh, he wrote to the founders themselves. They read his writings. He said, what is the best government? That which teaches us to govern ourselves. We teach this to pastors at our uh, boot camps because most guys don't, they don't even understand that. It's just America. It's America. No, it was founded on certain ideas that work. Listen to a preacher out of the, eight, uh, the 19th century. This is Henry Ward Beecher. He says, there is no liberty to men who know not how to govern themselves. Listen to John Adams, 1776. Public virtue cannot exist in a nation without private virtue. Notice the contrast, public, private. And public virtue is the only foundation of republics. You say, oh, well, that's all that government talk. Now, let, me, let me put it in common English. The only way you're ever going to be free is if the culture is virtuous. Well, we're not. We turned our backs on God decades ago, I think way before prayer was taken out of schools. That was just the heart that finally evidenced itself in those silly things, meaning the, the removal. That was all ridiculous, but the heart was already there, I fear. This is George Washington in his farewell address in 1796 and to a letter to Marquis de Lafayette on February 7, 1788. Virtue or morality is a necessary spring of popular government. Human rights can only be assured among a virtuous people. 
Here's Samuel Adams, the founder and the leader of the Sons of Liberty in Boston. Neither the wisest constitution nor the wisest laws will secure the liberty and happiness of a people whose manners are universally corrupt. He, therefore, is the truest friend of the liberty of his country who tries most to promote its virtue. Its virtue. Here's James Madison in the ratifying convention in Virginia, June the 20th, 1788, to suppose that any form of government will secure liberty or happiness without any virtue in the people is an imaginary idea, he says. In other words, it's nonsense. Wicked people will not be free because they cannot govern themselves. And freedom civilly is based upon purity personally. And we've lost that, friends. And they say, well, Dan, you're telling this to a, to a room full of church folks. Well, let me deal with that here in just a second. But one last quote. We've all heard it. Benjamin Franklin, April the 17th, 1787. Only a virtuous people are capable of freedom. You say, but Dan, Dan, we're Christians here. Yes, we are. And maybe, hopefully, our church may be a little cut above the normal. Because I'm telling you, across this country, churches are filled with people that are not sincere or they're not dedicated or they're not committed to God. And we're so casual with Him that we never feel the need to come forward in an invitation and bow a knee and pray. Now, I realize there's nothing, and I said this to my class this morning, there's nothing more holy about these wooden steps that we turn into an altar every Sunday than your seat or your car or your house. But there is just something about when God's people get together and they're called to repentance, that there's just something about people getting up and just putting their faces down toward the ground and asking God to help us. But we don't even do that much here. When was the last time you saw a flood of people come and, and pray just because they were moved by God's Spirit? And it's not because they just committed adultery or robbed a bank. It's just they really wanted to see God do something in their own lives and in the life of their church and their community. Now, I'm not trying to get on to I'm not trying to scold you. And by the way, during the invitation today, don't everybody get up and run down here because I just said that. When was the last time? When was the last time you saw a congregation really break before God? Now, I've been in congregations where they're swaying and all this kind of stuff, and they call that repentance. I don't, I don't buy it. Every time in Scripture when God's people repented, they were on their faces and they were weeping. Not because they'd committed some kind of heinous sin. It's because they desired to be close and right to God. Ezekiel 16. Look. This was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride. Pride month. Fullness of food. Well, Dan, the stock market's still okay. Well, it was in Sodom too. An abundance of idleness. That means it wouldn't work. Go to any place that pays minimum or just a little above wage today. And what do they have on their doors and windows? Signs that say hiring. You know why they're doing that? Because the government's been paying people not to work. We're a culture that's, that's increasingly lazy. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. They were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw fit. God said, I didn't have to ask for permission. These people were wicked. And when I decided it was time, I took them out. You say, well, Dan, you know, we're not that bad. Well, just hang on here for a second. Isaiah chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. For Jerusalem stumbled and Judah is fallen because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord to provoke the eyes of His glory. The look on their countenance witnesses against them and they declare their sin as Sodom. Notice this common string. They do not hide it. They flaunt it. Woe to their soul. Notice he didn't say woe to their Walmart, uh, uh, Wall, uh, Wall Street. Woe to their stock market. Woe to their bank accounts. He says woe to their soul. The part of them that lives forever. For they have brought evil upon themselves. It wasn't God just turned his back on them. They'd turn their back on him. And so today's church walks around strutting 
We have fine buildings. We're all doing better than we probably ever thought or at least hoped we would. And yet we're distracted by anything and everything. We all can make excuses why we don't want to do anything inconvenient, uncomfortable. Don't, yeah, we, we all want to serve if it's some place of management. Just let me know when you need somebody to run things and I'll, I'll sign up. Churches the size of this one, now I'm not dissing, please understand. Churches the size of this one should never have to pay to have its grounds mowed and trimmed and kept. We all do our own, don't we? But you see, we have to here. Now, I'm not dissing anybody or anything. Please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. We're haughty. Friends, I'm telling you, we're haughty. Even those of us who know the Lord, we're haughty. When was the last time you wept just because you didn't feel like you were as close to God as you ought to be? When was the last time that you were in close proximity to God that you knew it and you wept just because you were close to Him? It doesn't happen much, friends. It doesn't happen in America. Now, I'm getting to the end here. In Matthew chapter 11, Jesus was talking to the people of his day. And basically he said, there's some really wicked places on this planet. And if they had heard the kind of preaching and saw the kind of miracles that you've seen, they'd have repented. And then I want you to look about verse 22. And he says, and you Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven. In other words, you think you're big stuff. You will be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done where? In Sodom. Now all sin is sin. We all get it. But there, there are sins that are kind of the bottom of the barrel. And sodomy, God says, is at the bottom of the barrel. It's one of the sins that he calls an abomination. All sin's bad. But there's some sins that are more bad. And he says, look, if the things that have been done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained till this day. But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom. Now, by the way, how tolerable was it in Sodom? Well, Lot's wife found out, not too tolerable. He said, well, it's more tolerable there than in the day of judgment for you. So then Peter kind of wraps it up by saying, for the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? You say, Dan, what can we do? Is there hope? Oh, there's always hope in God. Don't ever write off the God factor. But it's going to take God's people getting serious about God's stuff. And I don't know what you're like, but I can tell you right now, I'm constantly distracted by stuff that doesn't matter. But I allow it to matter to me. And they're the incidentals of life. Most churches and most people in churches today are all fuzzed up about stuff that doesn't even matter. And the things that really do matter, we ignore like they don't even exist. There are churches that split over the styles of music that they play. There are churches that split over the color of carpet that they purchase. There are churches that split over the fact that I didn't want to relocate, I wanted to build here. There are churches that split over every possible thing you can imagine. And all the while, we call ourselves God's people. And we tolerate wickedness and evil in our own lives. So judgment must begin with God's people. I want to close with this statement. You've read it if you've ever been to the Jefferson Memorial. I've led tours there many times. But even if you haven't been there, you've read this. Thomas Jefferson wrote on the notes on the state of Virginia, query number 18. Indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just. That his justice cannot sleep forever. Now I don't know whether Benjamin, I mean, excuse me, that Thomas Jefferson ever became a born again believer or not. I don't know. A lot of evidence said maybe not. I don't know. 
But even a man who may not have been born again had it right. When I reflect that God is just and that his justice cannot sleep forever, he said, I tremble for my country. Friends, we better begin to pray and we better begin to get our own lives in order. Because what happened in Uvalde is not the result of runaway gun ownership and illegal possession of arms and even the school officials or the local police. Let me tell you what caused Uvalde. It's what's causing this stuff all over our country and this cascade and the meltdown of our culture, godlessness. And it starts with God's people first. Adrian Rogers said something. I was listening to him yesterday. He said something that just jumped off of that computer into my heart. He talked about how God's wrath was smoldering. You ever had a fire that smoldered? The main fire went out and you thought it was all gone. But there were coals underneath the ashes and they smoldered. And you got up the next day and found out that there was another big fire going that you thought you'd extinguish. Friends, I fear that God's wrath is smoldering. You say, well, Dan, why, why, why do you think God would be so upset at us? Well, the Bible says where much has been given, much is required. God will judge America more harshly than he will Sodom. And I'll tell you why, because we had a godly beginning. We've had the greatest opportunity to honor God of any culture in the history of mankind, and we've squandered it away. God will be more harsh on us than he was on Sodom. And I fear if we do not repent soon, the Uvaldes are only the tip of the iceberg. Would you bow your heads with me? I know this has been a difficult message. I get it. I know it. We want to come in sometimes and just hear goody, 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 tutti, fruity news. But friends, I'm telling you, I think God is calling to his people and he's asking his people to get serious. How serious are you? If you don't know Jesus today, if I were you, I'd be shaken in my seat. The minute this invitation begins, I'd jump up and I'd run down here and I'd grab one of these counselors and I'd say, please help me to be saved. If you're a Christian and you're not walking right with God and you know it, I'd be shaking in my seat. The minute the invitation begins, I'd run down here and I'd say, please help me. If God's been telling you to join this church and you've been playing around with it, I'd be shaking in my seat. I'd jump up when this invitation begins and I'd run down here and I'd grab one of these counselors and I'd say, please help me. I want to be a part, an active part of this church. Whatever it is, we're out of time, way out of time. So I'm going to pray. And you need to come, but you need to come quickly. Father, in Jesus' name, we've heard some tough stuff. I know it. I hope I delivered it properly. Lord, if I didn't, forgive me. We live in disturbing days, Lord. We all know it. But God, we're looking for answers, and the answers are staring us right in the face off the pages of your word. But for many of us, we just don't want to hear the answers because we don't like them. God, help me. Lord, I... I I allow so many things to press you to the back of the line. I allow so many things to distract me from the more important things. So, Lord, I am not without guilt. Lord, help your people. Help your people to judge themselves so that you won't have to. Father, move in our church, move in our community, move in our culture. Before the fire of your, your wrath and your judgment falls. So I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.